This video covers the last part of section 8.3 of the pre-calculus textbook. We've been studying um, values for tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant, and now we're going to take a look at their graphs. We will be using the class notes and example sheet from section 8.3. Um, the back side of it. The front side has the, the, tab the large table on it, and we'll be using the back side. So let's get started. As you can see, we're trying to graph um, y equals tangent of x right here. And we're going to take a look at it in terms of sine and cosine, because we are very familiar with sine and cosine. And using the fact that tangent is sine over cosine, what we'd like to do is really pay attention to the denominator. It's really going to dictate what happens to the graph of tangent. I've taken the liberty of drawing in the uh, cosine curve, as you can see right here. And I've also drawn, sketched in um, a unit circle, just by hand. And so just starting, say, at the uh, y-intercept, of course, we have um, the tangent of zero is going to be zero, right? Because our, uh, our, our sine is zero and our cosine is one. So therefore we know that this point here, let me get my graph going here. I think I'll use blue for the graph. So we know the point zero, zero is on our curve. What we want to keep in mind is as our angle is going from zero, you know, on up to pi over 2, our numerator, which is the sine, you know, is simply going to be going from 0 to 1, right? 0 over here up to 1. But the denominator, as we were saying, is going to actually play the major role as it goes from 1 down to 0. Of course, we know that at pi over 4, which is right in here, our tangent is going to be 1, because it's root 2 over 2 divided by root 2 over 2. So I'm going to Put a little mark kind of right there to indicate where we are. Um, and as we cross beyond pi over 4, you know, we get we get further up right, right up here, and our angle is getting closer and closer to pi over 2. Our cosine values, which we can see on the graph, are getting really small. Okay, so the closer we get to this pi over 2, which is right right here, right? We got pi over 2 right along this line right here. Our cosine values are getting really tiny. So we might imagine, you know, um, think of it as our, our sine values are getting close to 1. So it's like we've got 1, let me put that over here, over a really small number. So it might be like 1 over 1 1,000th, okay? And of course we know that's going to be a very large number, like 1,000. And the closer we get to closer we get here to pi over two, or right here on our graph, the closer we get to pi over two, our cosine value is just getting really small. So we might even go smaller than, than one one thousandth. We might have like one over you know one one million. Okay, or a bunch of zeros. That's what one over one one hundred thousandth. And of course, that's going to give us a very large number, even larger number. So the closer we're getting to pi over 2, the bigger our output values are for tangent, the bigger our tangents are. And I'm just trying to mark some, some points there. And then, of course, what happens right at pi over 2 is that we are now dividing 1 by 0. And we all know that 1 divided by 0 is undefined. So you can see that what we have here is uh, some asymptotic behavior happening, that our, our tangent values are getting closer and closer to, uh, well, our tangent values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger as our angle gets closer and closer to pi over 2. So our tangent kind of looks like this. It's, it's kind of increasing um, asymptotically as we, as we get closer and closer to pi over 2. All right. Now what's going to happen right after uh, our angle here at pi over 2 is we're suddenly going to have still some very small 
cosine values, all right, but they're going to be negative. And you can see that down here with the graph. We're going to have really small negative cosine values while our sine values stay very close to 1. So instead of, you know, being 1 over 1 1,000th, we might be 1 over negative 1 1,000th, which is giving us really large negative numbers, all right? And as our angle comes closer and closer to pi, right, these, uh, these cosine values right here, these cosine values just get closer and closer to, one, to negative 1, all right, while our sine values get closer and closer to 0. So once again, once we get to pi, we are going to be back down, we are going to be back down here to, or back to zero right here at pi. And so, and so our graph is looking kind of like this, where we have these, these uh, large negative values getting closer and closer to zero till we get to pi. All right, so what happens beyond pi, as our angle moves beyond pi, um, we still have some uh, basically, our, our sine is really close to zero, and uh, but it's moving into being negative numbers. Sine will be negative, and so will cosine. And so our cosine values, as you can see um, right here, our cosine values right after pi are very close to negative 1, but as we get closer and closer to 3 pi over 2, they become very small negative numbers. But remember, sine is also negative in this quadrant of the of the unit circle. So therefore our tangent is going to be positive and we're going to end up with actually really large positive numbers. So you, you can kind of just see the trend that the uh, that the curve is making that is going to come back up through pi and from pi, whoops, got the wrong color there, go back to blue, and from pi we're going to just keep on going and get closer and closer to infinity, or be heading towards infinity as we approach 3 pi over 2. And once again, at 3 pi over 2, our, uh, our cosine is 0, as we can see right here, and we'll be dividing, we'll basically have negative 1 over 0 at that point, which is still undefined. So let me draw in uh, another asymptote there. Let's see if we get the red guy going here, and we've got our asymptotic behavior, okay? So this trend just kind of keeps repeating itself. Um, in fact, had we gone backwards a little bit, we had the same thing happening you know, over here in the fourth quadrant before we got to zero. Whoops. Before we got to zero, we had these angles where um, I guess the, uh, the cosine was positive, but the sine was negative, and close to negative pi over 2, we had very small... Uh, very small numbers again, you know, pointing them out for cosine. So very small cosines uh, being divided into um, basically signs that are close to negative 1 gives us very large negative numbers down here. So I can complete this, this part of the curve too. Just coming back up here, whoops, wrong color again. Here's our blue curving up there. So you just kind of see this pattern happening over and over again with tangent, and it happens every pi units that we just get this, we get this kind of a, kind of a cubic curve almost. That's really what it's looking like. All right. Now writing the domain for for curves like this are not. It's not an easy task because um, you have to um, take a you know point out that you're missing some values uh, all along the way in a periodic fashion. But doing the doing the range in the period is actually not that difficult. So why don't you pause the video and see if you can figure out what the range in the period are, and then we'll talk about the domain. Check and see if this is what you got. Yes, indeed, the range is all real numbers. As you look at it, just kind of sweeping across. There's no, there's no y value that's not included in this graph. All right, 
and the period is pi. As you can see, we're going from uh, what negative pi over two here to positive pi over two before we've you know we've completed the cycle. By then, we start all over again. So, the period is pi. All right, now for the domain. The best way to talk about the domain of one of these functions is to just go ahead and say, you know, just kind of assume it's it's all reals except okay. So usually what we do, this is this is kind of some set notation. Remember, a domain is a set. So we can say it's the set of all values x such that, and now we'll say what x cannot be, okay? Such that x cannot be, and we just pick one value that x cannot be. One of the values x cannot be is pi over 2, all right? And then what we do is we simply add to that um, the distance we have to go to get to the next asymptote or the next place where we're undefined. So we have to we have to travel about pi units to get to the next place. So I picked out pi over two, and I'm going to have to go pi units to get to the next place. So so I'm just going to write pi x cannot equal pi over two plus pi k times k. All right. You've seen this notation before. We talked about this. We used this notation back when we did um, coterminal angles, and those you know re repeating after a certain amount of time. So this is this is what it is. So you just pick one. We could have we could have chosen negative pi over two and said you know x cannot be negative pi over two plus pi k. All right, and we'd be good. Now it looks like I did forget to close my braces here for my set. All right, well, that's, that's the tangent graph. Now we're going to take a, a quick look at the cotangent graph. Now that we've done the tangent, actually the cotangent graph um, is, is going to be a little simpler. All right. Before we move into cotangent, I just wanted to point out another way that you can think about tangent. And you can see here I've written, you know, just to remind us that tangent theta is y over x. Let's look at an angle such as, say, pi over 4, which we know splits the quadrant. Okay. Now, if we put y over x, of course, that's root 2 over 2 over root 2 over 2, right? Our y is root 2 over 2, and our x is root 2 over 2. Well, you know, you can think of it this way, if we start at the origin and we move y units root 2 over 2 and then we divide that by x units root 2 over 2, right, we're simply describing the slope of this terminal side right here, right? We know the slope of this terminal side is 1. Well, that's true for any angle theta that, that you're looking at on the unit circle, that the tangent of, the th of theta is going to equal the slope. Um, here I'm just going to go equal m equals the slope of the terminal side. So as you, you know, as we increase the angle, as the angle goes from 0 up to pi over 2, what's happening to the slope of our terminal side is it's just increasing, right? Until you get to pi over 2, which is vertical, and we know that slope is basically infinite or just or undefined because it's, it's uh, you know, 1 over 0. But we've got, before we get to pi over 2, we've got really steep slopes, which means we have really large numbers for our tangents, right? So, so that's what's happening here, right? We have, whoops, didn't get my pen to work here. Um, so we have it coming up. It's 0. The slope is 0, right, at the angle of 0, right? That's a horizontal line. And then as we get closer and closer to pi over 2, the slope of our terminal side just gets um, higher and higher because we're getting steeper and steeper. And then, of course, on the back end here, we have, we have negative slopes, right? These are, we're going down, down, and to the right. Um, so we have negative slopes. So all the way from negative pi over 2, we have negative values for our tangent. All right, so that's another way to think about um, dealing with, you know, why the shape of tangent is what it is. To do the cotangent graph for the first time, um, you can see I've I've gone ahead and graphed the tangent curve. All right, and so I think what we'll use you may not use this all the time, but at least for the first time, 
let's use the fact that we know the cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent graph. All right. So if we can keep that in mind, all we're doing is we're taking the reciprocals of all the y values or all the output values of this curve right here. And if we can think about what that, what's going to happen there with those, then uh, we can get a feel for the cotangent graph. All right. I'm going to do the cotangent graph in red, I think. All right. So we're starting, just maybe starting at zero. Um, first of all, all right, so the output value is zero at zero. And what is the reciprocal of zero? Well, we know that zero is like zero over one, so its reciprocal is just going to be one over zero, which is undefined. So we're not going to have any point right, right here at zero. But what if we move just a little ways to the right of, you know, of zero, zero? That is a very small positive number. And what happens if you take the reciprocal of a small positive number? So in other words, we're going to do 1 over a small positive. Okay? Well, you know, a small positive number might be like, uh, you know, 1 over 1,000. So if we take the reciprocal of 1 over 1,000, that, of course, is going to be a large positive number, which is a thousand. So one over a small positive is actually equal to a large uh, positive. All right. So that means we actually have very large output values for a cotangent happening right after, um, right after zero. And as our values for tangent get larger and larger, okay, the values for cotangent are going to get smaller and smaller, right? As you make, uh, you know, when you do 1 over a number, if that number gets bigger, which is what's going to happen with our tangent values, then our whole fraction gets smaller, right? So we could write it this way, that 1, one over a large positive number is going to equal a small positive number. All right. And so that's really what's happening, that as our tangent values get larger and larger, our cotangent values are going to get smaller and smaller and just come on down. All right? So we can kind of see what's happening. It's going to get smaller and smaller. Here, let me get, start to make some of these points. Now, at, at power of 4, we're at 1, and the reciprocal of 1 is just 1. Okay? I can't seem to make some points. And then as we get these get closer and closer to pi over 2, our cotangent graph is just getting smaller and smaller positive numbers till we get to pi over 2. And right at pi over 2, um, right at pi over 2, we're going to have undefined. Well, undefined is like 1 over 0. So the reciprocal of 1 over 0 is simply going to be 0. So our cotangent value you know, at pi over 2 is 0, and you can check it out, right? It'd be the cosine of pi over 2 divided by the sine of pi over 2, which would be um, 0 over 1. I forgot to put the over 1, which equals 0. Now, what's going to happen right after we cross over pi over 2 right here is you can see our tangent values are very large negative numbers, right? So just like we had... 1 over large positive numbers equaling a small positive, 1 over large negative is just going to be a small negative. And so it just kind of follows this trend we've got. And as our, uh, as our tangent values get closer and closer to 0, so they become small negative numbers, then when we take the reciprocal, we're going to have large negative numbers instead of large positive. So... This curve just keeps on going down, as you might have guessed. And I'm just going to see if I can draw it in here. Give this a good curve. So it's going to go like that and cross and then come on down. All right. And, of course, once we get to uh, pi, where the tangent is 0, the reciprocal of that is going to be undefined. So we do have a vertical asymptote at pi. And the same thing's happening at, uh, at zero, right there on that vertical asymptote. 
Now I've sketched in the sine curve, and you can see what's happening, that every time the sine curve hits zero, right, because the sine is in our denominator, every time that hits zero, that's where we have a vertical asymptote. So this is really handy knowledge, knowing what the sine curve looks like, we can very quickly identify where our vertical asymptotes are. There's another one here. Whoops, let me go back to red. There's another one here at uh, negative pi, right? And there's another one, you know, another one at 2 pi, and there's one at negative 2 pi. And so now that we kind of sense what the shape of our, uh, of our cotangent curve is, we can just set up our asymptotes and then just draw in the curve. We know it's basically going to look like, like this. It's decreasing as opposed to increasing, right? That's one difference between the, the tangent and the cotangent curves, all right? And, but they otherwise, they look kind of similar, right? Look very much like cubic curves with asymptotes. Okay, well, I'd like you to um, just take a little bit of time and determine the domain, range, and period of the cotangent curve, and then uh, you can check and see if you got what I got. All right, why don't you pause the video right now? Okay, check and see if this is what you got. Hopefully you realize that, you know, the period hasn't changed. We're still going pi units to get from one asymptote to the next, which is starting our curve over again. And our range didn't change, right? We're still having points that uh, all, all the numbers uh, for y values are reflected in our points. And just the domain has changed a little bit, right? It's, we still are going to go pi k units, but we're not starting in the same place, right? The, we've kind of shifted a little bit. Our asymptote now, we could start at 0 and just do 0 plus pi k. And of course, if you just want to write that as um, equal to pi k, that is fine. Um, you might also notice I didn't use the, the set notation here. It is okay just to, um, just to say what x cannot equal. You, know, you can just say, well, x cannot equal pi times k. And if I forgot to mention earlier, um, k, this is where k is, we're assuming k is any integer. All right, that's what we assumed before when we did this. Okay, so now we're looking at the secant curve, or the secant graph that we want to sketch, and we do know that that is also a reciprocal, right? Reciprocal of cosine. So you can see here, I've, I've sketched in the graph of cosine. Now, if you don't have a different color, what I would do when you sketch in the graph of cosine is just to do like a dashed graph, okay? So we know that that's not the actual graph we, we want to look at. And I'm going to leave this this one for you to do, all right? Use the same technique we did for cotangent, where you think about the output values for cosine here and about taking their reciprocals, all right? And then see what shape you end up with, all right? So why don't you pause the video um, and, and try to sketch the curve for secant. Okay, see if you got this. I like to describe the shape of uh, the secant curve as being like opposing horseshoes. Um, and hopefully you figured out that you do have asymptotes at these, you know, pi over 2, negative pi over 2. Everywhere that cosine hits 0, right, there's going to be an asymptote there. And then you're just going to have a, this horseshoe shape come down, and it will touch the same point at 0, 1, right, because the reciprocal of 1 is 1, and then go back up. Right? As, as these values get really small. And then you have the same thing happening on the negative, right? Small negative values for cosine mean large negative values for secant. All right, and so that's the shape of secant. Why don't you now go ahead and fill in the domain, the range, and the period. Pause the video and do that. Okay, see if this is what you got for those. These are a little different than what we saw with tangent and cotangent, right? Um, now we still have the, the domain actually is, is fairly similar, right? Every, 
three pi units, we're having an asymptote, so we just need to pick one out, and pi over 2 is one of them. And then we just add plus pi k, where k is any integer. Now the range is a little different though, right? It's not all reals. We go all the way up till we get to negative 1, and then we've got this gap in here where there's no points with you know y values between negative 1 and positive 1, and then we pick it up with positive 1. And you can see I'm using the interval notation, um, and so I'm include, I want to include the negative 1 and the positive 1, so that's why we have the brackets here. All right, And then, did you get the period right? A lot of times students will say the period is pi because they're just going by the asymptotes, but it actually takes two pi units to start repeating again, right? If I start at 0 and I move to the right, I'm going to have to go two pi units before I get back to this point at, you know, at 1 that I have started at. So it actually takes a full 2 pi, just like the period of cosine. All right, so we got one more to do. Let's take a look at cosecant. I challenge you to do the cosecant graph all by yourself. We've got it set up. We know it's 1 over sine, so I will suggest that maybe you sketch the sine curve so you can get your asymptotes set, all right? But you take it from here, and once you have your graph, why don't you fill in the domain of range and period, and then uh, you can check it with what I have. So pause the video and go for it. Okay, see if this is what you got. You can see that I drew in the uh, sine curve here, and that immediately let me know where my asymptotes were. It's where sine was crossing the x-axis. I mean, where yeah, where sine was crossing the x-axis, and uh, then you know, no surprise here that the shape of this curve is very similar to secant, just kind of shifted over a little bit. So the domain's a little different, right? Now our we could start at zero and add pi k, so that's why. I just say x cannot equal pi k. And then our range, that has not changed, right? And our period has not changed. So the only difference is we just kind of shifted the graph of secant over. We have three more um, examples we're going to look at. So, um, and they get a little more complicated, but not, but not too bad. So let's take a look. Even though the directions just ask for the domain, range, and period of these functions in number three, um, the best way to get those things is to really go ahead and graph it. You know, get a graph or at least an understanding of what the graph's going to look like. And then generally you can um, get the domain, range, and period pretty, pretty well. So how do we get the graph of y equals tangent of 8x? Well, that really stems from your understanding of the graphs of sine and cosine, and especially in this case, um, we'd be wanting to pay attention to the graph of our denominator. So let's see, we have sine, this tangent of 8x would be the sine of 8x, right? 8x is like our angle, divided by the cosine of 8x. Okay, so what we're going to focus on is what is the graph of cosine of 8x. And if we can get that, then it's really not hard to get the graph of tangent of 8x. So let's just draw ourselves a pair of axes. Um, all right. And cosine, let's see. Now there's no shift going on here. So, um, so I'm just going to sketch the cosine curve first. Okay, I know it's going to look like this without any shifts. And we'll come across the other way. Notice I'm kind of using a dash curve just because this is not going to be, you know, my actual graph of, of uh, the tangent. Okay, and so let's see. So one, one full uh, cycle here, we know, let's see, normally that'd be 2 pi, but we've got this 8 up here. So our period, right, let's see, get my pen going. So our period is going to be 2 pi. Right, divided by that b, so divided by 8. So our period is pi over 4. All right, so that's got to be this number, pi over 4. And then, of course, halfway through our cycle, it's going to be half of pi over 4. So here we are at 
pi over 8. All right, and we're at 0, and then over here would be a negative. Uh, I'm sorry, then 0, right. So I want, what I, what I really need to know, sorry, I kind of uh, lost my train of thought, but what I really need to know is where is the cosine curve hitting the x-axis? That's what's really important, because that's where my asymptotes are. So I need to go another right, halfway between 0 and pi over 8. So this would be happening at pi over 16, right? And then this one over here, another place where we're crossing the x-axis. Let's see, all we got to do is count, right? So we have 1 pi, 1 pi over 16. Sorry, I forgot to make that a 16. 1 pi over 16. And then here we're at 2 pi over 16, so this spot right here must be 3 pi over 16 and then of course 4 pi over 16 is pi over 4 all right and so over here we've kind of got this symmetry so this would be a negative pi over 16 and then again we're going to be at negative 3 pi over 16 all right I think I'm a little not being real even with my uh, with my units but that's all right. So we're going to draw in our asymptotes. Asymptote there, asymptote there. Got an asymptote here at 3 pi over 16, and then another one at negative 3 pi over 16. That should be probably a little further over. All right. And we know the basic shape of our curve, right? We know that it's that it's basically tangent is increasing. If you remember tangent is increasing and looks kind of like the cubic curve, then all you got to do is come up through here. And there you go. There's... That part, this, we want to make sure we go through 0, 0. And then this part here is going to go through pi over 8. So there we go. There's our curve. All right. So let's write down our domain and our range, right? So domain, we can just say x is, assume it's all reals, but what can it not be? It's not going to be, you know what? I'm going to leave this for you to do, and then you can check. So pause the video and go for it. All right, see if this is what you got. Okay, hopefully you said um, that x couldn't be pi over 16. Now, maybe you chose one of the other asymptotes. That's fine. You could have said negative pi over 16 or 3 pi over 16. And then how far do we have to go to get to the next one? It'd be pi over 8. So that's why we say plus pi over 8k. And our range is all reals. And our period is going to be pi over 8, the distance between our asymptotes here. All right, let's go look at the next one. This next one is very similar, as you can see, to the first one we did in number three. Uh, we just have this minus pi over two. So, of course, we know that means some kind of horizontal shift going on. But do be careful, all right? Let's get it in the form that we're used to uh, in order to read the shift. So we have this y equals, and then we have tangent. Okay, but before we read the shift, let's pull that 8 out, right? So we pull that out, then we're left with x minus, and I think if we factor 8 from pi over 2, we should be left with pi over 16, right? We're just dividing pi over 2 by 8, or think of it as multiplying pi over 2 by 1 over 8. And of course, when we're done, let's check and make sure that that gives us what we want. If we distribute our, you know, our 8 across here, we will have 8x minus pi over 2, right? 8 goes in 16 two times. All right, so really the only difference here in our new function and our old one is that we're simply shifting it to the right pi over 16 units. So go ahead and, and write down what that would do for the domain and the range and the period. Okay, now did you get this? As you might have expected, not much changed in our answers, right? Really the only thing that changed was our domain since our, uh, our vertical asymptotes were shifted to the right pi over 16 units. I just looked at this one at negative pi over 16. That puts it right at zero. So there we go, zero plus still pi over 8k. Period hasn't changed, range hasn't changed. All right. We got one more example to do, and then I think uh, you can start working on the homework if you'd like. 
For this last one, you can see uh, we don't have any horizontal shifts, but we do have a couple of vertical things happening. All right. So, um, you know, once again, let's see if we can get somewhat of a graph of this of this curve, this cosecant curve. And um, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna sketch the graph of, let's see, we got y equals equals cosecant of pi over three. Let's just focus on that part. All right, pi over three x. Now, that would be the same thing, right, as one over sine of pi over 3x. So if you can sketch a graph of the sine of pi over 3x, you really shouldn't have much trouble getting the cosecant of pi over 3x. All right, so draw yourself a, some axes, right? And, you know, there's no shift going on, so just go ahead and sketch in, you know, maybe dot in your, your sine curve. I should have made that shorter there. Extend the, extend that out. All right, and now see if you can take it from here, um, at least to get the the graph of cosecant of pi over three x. All right, why don't you pause the video and do that? Okay, so maybe the trickiest part here is uh, making sure you have the period. Yes, yeah, so you can see us, we, you know, we've got our sine curve. We need to figure out how far it is to go through one cycle. So 2 pi divided by pi over 3 actually gives us 6, right? So that's not too bad. We've got 6, halfway through is 3. I didn't space my units out very well here, but... And then we've got negative 3 and negative 6 over here, so that's where our asymptotes are. We also have an asymptote at 0, all right? Don't overlook that, because sine curve does cross 0 at 0. Crosses the x-axis at 0. And then 3 and 6, and then we can draw in our opposing horseshoes, all right? Now, we still haven't taken into account this, this 3, but remember now, usually, and of course we're supposed to be marking this, but... Usually we're we're going we're coming down as low as one, and you know and negative one right on these curves. Well, with that three, that's just going to stretch things, and this number is now a three, and this number is a negative three right here. So that's how we can take care of that. And then as far as you know this plus two, we know that would just be a vertical shift up two units. Okay, so I don't know how you want to deal with that, but. I'm not going to resketch this graph. So, so we want to think of it. This is really uh, your midline now is y equal to two, and if we go up two units, so that would make this number right here five, right as high as we're going. And then negative three plus two would just put us at negative one. So we're just going to kind of do a little trickery here, since all we have to do is figure out domain range and period. All right. Why don't you fill the fill those in and then you know pause the video right now, fill those in, and then you can check your answers. See if this is what you got. Okay, here are my final answers. Right? So I chose, I decided to choose zero for that first asymptote, and then all we have to do is add three to it to get to the next one. So it's zero plus three k, or you might just said it is three k, of course, where k is an integer. Our range, I decided to write it out using the, uh, you know, using the uh, inequality symbol. So y can be less than or equal to negative 1, right? Any value less than or equal to negative 1. Or it can be any value greater than or equal to 5, okay? And then our period is simply 6, right? It's how long it takes to go through one complete cycle to get back to where we started from. So from this point right here all the way to that point right there, is a total of six units. I guess, yeah, kind of halfway between. This would be a negative 4.5, and this would be a negative, a positive 1.5, and that's a total of six units. Okay, well, that was a lot. Um, if you want to get a head start on the homework, um, certainly feel free to do start the second assignment off the assignment sheet for section A3. It is, you know, don't it's not due the next time we meet, but you certainly are welcome to, to get ahead if you'd like to. 
All right. Hope this video was helpful. Please uh, be ready to ask questions if you have some.